Good morning. I'm Reverend Vicki Elder, as most of you know, and it's my joy and honor to welcome you to Unity of Monterey Bay, a beloved community co-created with love and intention that welcomes all people, all races, ages, cultures, ethnic backgrounds, economic circumstances, nationalities, and religions. Whatever your immigration status, sexual orientation, gender identity, family configuration, and or abilities, whether you're here with us in person or joining us virtually, we know that love has no boundaries. We are one in spirit. As a purpose-driven church, Unity of Monterey Bay is an inclusive spiritual community committed to co-creating an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just, and compassionate human presence on this planet. We celebrate our oneness and honor the God of each of our understanding, affirming the innate good and divine essence within each and every individual. Would you please join me in our statement of faith? There is only one presence and one power in the universe, God the good, expressing as infinite God beyond us, intimate God beside us, inner God being us, divine love in action. And as we allow this knowing to deepen within our souls and serve to awaken us into enlightenment for the benefit of all living beings, I share a poem by Amanda Gorman the first National Youth Poet Laureate, entitled, Hymn for the Hurting. Everything hurts, our hearts shadowed and strange, minds made muddied and mute. We carry tragedy, terrifying and true, and yet none of it is new. We knew it as home, as horror, as heritage. Even our children cannot be children, cannot be. Everything hurts. It's a hard time to be alive and even harder to stay that way. We're burdened to live out these days while at the same time blessed to outlive them. This alarm is how we know we must be altered, that we must differ or die, that we must triumph or try. Thus, while hate cannot be terminated, it can be transformed into love that lets us live. May we not just grieve, but give. May we not just ache, but act. May our signed right to bear arms never blind our sight from shared harm. May we choose our children over chaos. May another innocent never be lost. Maybe everything hurts, our hearts shadowed and strange, but only when everything hurts may everything change. And so breathing into this moment of truth, our hearts once again broken open Inviting us into transformation, let us affirm together. Thank you, God, for this most amazing day. Miracle follows miracle, and wonders never cease. And now we get to celebrate our children, those here in our spiritual community, those in our families, and in our larger community, all of the children of the world. We hold them in our hearts and we see them protected and resilient, creative and evolving, joyous and loved as we join in our heartfelt blessing. We love you. We bless you. We appreciate you just the way you are. This bright light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. take a collective deep breath in and let it out with an audible sigh. <sighs> As we center ourselves to embrace this blissful interconnection with spirit and invite the chime to call us into this sacred space within.
we ring the chime four times to call in the four directions and remind us of our interconnection with all of creation and with the sacred circle of life. As we feel it resonate through our very beings, we follow its call into this now present moment within. Continuing to focus on our breath, with each inhale, we open our hearts and minds. We envision our breath reaching every cell of our being. And with each exhale, we see all barriers and obstacles dissolving into the divine flow. And again, as we inhale, we expand the spaciousness within us. We move beyond the limitations and boundaries of our bodies. And as we exhale, we ground ourselves deep within Mother Earth and into our oneness with the universe. Finally, we breathe our awareness into the highest expression of love, light, joy, and peace we can imagine as we experience a transforming wave of gratitude with a fullness of heart, we say yes to it all. Embracing, claiming, and knowing the divine Christ spirit expressing in, through, and as us. And with a final exhale, we say, thank you, God. So now fully centered and transformed by the power of spirit, we enter into our lesson and meditation time with today's daily word. This one? No, no, no. This, this one? one? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you want it up more? It's okay, I think. Can you hear me? No, yeah. you need, I think you need to get closer to it, doesn't you? I need to be closer? And why is this like that? I don't know. Maybe bring it. All right. <laughs> we read from the April 16th Daily Word, shared with permission of Unity, publisher of Daily Word, that can also be found at dailyword.com. And the word is world peace. I invite you to allow my words to be your words. My thoughtful choices bless the earth. To bring about peace in the world, I begin by paying attention to my first reaction when I feel I've been treated unjustly. I do not deny my feelings, but neither do I allow anger, envy, or other negative feelings to take control of my response. I feel my feelings, but I remain committed to living the truth I know. Regardless of my behavior, every person is a divine being, a living expression of God. I call upon my divine faculties of love, faith, and strength to guide my next steps. No matter how another responds, I remain centered in God. My efforts make a difference. Peace between individuals creates peace within families, in communities, and among the nations of the world. And from scriptures, the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. Isaiah 32, 17. I am that I am. 
of the many paths to the sacred, we read from three sacred paths on this morning's to topic, covenant. <clears throat> Can you hear okay? Okay. Okay, let's see. How about now? Better? People are saying yes, no, maybe. Just We've got a no and two yeses. <laughs> right at it, huh? Okay. How's that? Better? Good. In witness to the many paths to the sacred, we read from three sacred paths on this morning's topic, covenant, from Islam. And always remember the blessings which God has bestowed upon you and the solemn pledge by which he bound you to himself when you said, we have heard and we pay heed. Hence, remain conscious of God. Verily, God has full knowledge of what is in the hearts of men. From the Quran. From Judaism, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. And from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Jeremiah 31. And from Christianity, in the same way he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11.25. at the table for everyone born clean water and bread a shelter a space a safe place for growing for everyone born a star overhead and God will delight when we are created Creators of justice. 
That's one of those songs I could say, well, there's the lesson. But I do have a few notes to add. <laughs> so as noted in our e-blast this week, our COPA teams have been reading various articles and having many discussions about the meaning and importance of covenant as we approach COPA's upcoming 20th anniversary convention. I thought it would be useful to explore this concept of covenant within our larger UMB community. First, to shed light on the important and inherent intersection between religion and politics, especially given the increasing conversations about threats to our democracy, fighting for the soul of America, and whether or not the United States is a Christian nation. And second, to bring greater clarity to the nature of our involvement and work with COPA. For those of you who don't know, COPA is a community organizing program that uh, stands for Communities Organizing for Relational Power in Action. The R is left out of the acronym because when you say CORPA, it means death in Spanish. So, um, But that's what it stands for. And Unity's been a member of COPA along with 25 other churches, synagogues, nonprofits, unions, schools in the Monterey and Santa Cruz counties for about six years now. So let's begin with a basic definition or description of what covenant is. According to Britannica, a covenant is a binding promise of far-reaching importance in the relations between individuals, groups, and nations, having social, legal, religious, and other aspects. Historically, the concept of covenant is largely tied to traditions rooted in the Hebrew Bible including but not limited to the ultimate division of the Bible by Christians into the Old and New Testaments, which actually stands for the Old and New Covenants between God and God's people, which I'll address a little bit more in a bit. In fact, the Hebrew and Christian stories and subsequent evolving religions are grounded in interpretations of the series of covenants between God and God's people described in the scriptures. As one author put it, as the stories in the Bible unfold, we, si we see God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, and covenant-fulfilling God. The following are four examples of key bi biblical covenants that are central to the Judeo-Christian tradition. First, the Noahic covenant in Genesis 9, after the flood, refers to God's pledge given unconditionally to Noah and to every living creature on earth that reset and renewed the blessings of creation and reaffirmed a commitment to maintain the inherent relationship between creator and creation, including a promise to never again destroy the earth with a flood. It was accompanied by the sign of the rainbow. The Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 and 15, perhaps the most central to the biblical story, refers to God promising Abraham and through him extended to all the peoples of the earth a land, descendants, and blessing in exchange for their commitment to follow the path of God. The sign of this covenant is the ritual of circumcision. The Mosaic covenant in Exodus 19 and 24, established at Mount Sinai after the exodus from Egypt, which occurred, as they estimate, in the 13th, to 14th century BCE, I guess it said the 14th to 13th century BCE, since they kind of go backward, revealed God's law meant to govern and shape the people of Israel within the promised land. This covenant was clearly more conditional than previous ones, defining blessings and curses based on obedience or disobedience to the law. To understand, the understanding of the day was basically obey God and be blessed, disobey God and be cursed. The Mosaic law expanded over time as the Israelite tribes joined in building a nation from the original 10 statements, mistranslated from the Hebrew to commandments in the Christian scriptures, to a total of 613 laws located in Genesis through Deuteronomy. Note that the Pentateuch Torah, two words for the same thing, 
containing these laws was probably not compiled in its current form until the 5th century BCE during and or following the exile meaning that discerning God's law was an evolving process over the centuries and must be put in context of the eras, eras they were written in, like in response to the exile, as well as the corrupting influence of nation building on spiritual systems. It's not unlike the corrupting influence of Rome and modern po politicized U.S. Evan evangelicism on Christianity. With no respect, no disrespect meant to those who continue to or attempt to honor the letter of the law in scripture, I'm not alone in finding the earlier 8th century BCE writing of the prophet Micah on authentic and meaningful um, understanding of God's law. And you're going to recognize the, the verse from the song that we often sing. But this is how it goes. It says, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Finally, the fourth covenant I'm going to talk about is the new covenant from Jeremiah 31 that was read in the scripture reading. It is where God promises the people in exile. And again, you have to remember that exile was understood by the, the Jews that they were being punished for not living up to God's law. That's why they were forced into exile from their perspective. So... The promise was that the covenant with the houses of Israel and Judah would be renewed with God putting the law within them and writing it on their hearts. As noted earlier, Christians interpreted this new covenant to be fulfilled in Jesus, ultimately serving as a replacement for the Mosaic covenant, largely the result of Paul's outreach ministry to the Gentiles who ultimately took over the Christian movement. This shift from a Hebrew to a Gentile, in essence Greek perspective, also, unfortunately, resulted in Christianity and Jesus' teachings being truncated from their Hebrew roots, which has led to many misinter misinterpretations of Jesus' teachings and the early writings, which continue today. But that's a whole other lesson. Our unity understanding of these covenants, like our understanding of the entire Bible, is that they illustrate humanity's evolving understanding of God. All of these scriptures are written by individuals who are receiving through their filters an understanding of God's message to them. So humanity's understanding of in the very early days by all people were that if they were pleasing their God, they would be blessed. And if something went wrong in their lives, they must be displeasing their God because they gave not only the Hebrew God, but all the gods were given that kind of power. So the Hebrew people evolved their understanding of a God of, that was a strict disciplinarian who literally caused both the earthly blessings and hardships of the people based on their adherence to the laws to a loving, unconditional presence that is always within our hearts through good and bad times, calling us to a higher understanding of our own divine nature and inherent relationship with God wherein we can consistently experience God's eternal love and thus become expressions of that divine love in the world. So you might ask, what does all this have to do with our current politics and our current social covenants? In an article from the Jewish Journal from January of this year entitled Restoring the American Story, Rabbi Dr. Stu Halpern discusses how the influence of the Jewish story helped shape America's moral language of liberty and articulate its highest national ideals. He says, the Hebrew Bible has been the source of political and cultural vocabulary, providing a series of narratives and themes that have been powerful in the minds of the Puritan settlers, the revolutionaries, enslaved African Americans, the civil rights movement, and the broader population. For example, America's civil and criminal justice systems are grounded on the Mosaic Code, which predates Roman law and is the first to incorporate humanism and the democratic spirit into a written judicial code. 
four centuries before Christ, the Jews devised a legal system based on the dignity of man and individual equality before the law. Individuals accused of crimes were considered innocent until proven guilty, had the right to confront their accusers, were allowed to testify in their own behalf, were not subject to double jeopardy, and could appeal convictions. So how many of you were aware of that? I wasn't until I read that, that that tradition doesn't, that comes from our spiritual grounding. Halpern also includes the concept of covenant as part of this Hebrew legacy saying, whereas a contract entails rights of voluntary exit and is premised on the joining together for mutual self-interest, a covenant is an intergenerational commitment to a higher cause that transcends the individual and to which the individual dedicates himself. Both are very much present in the American tradition. Jonathan Sachs, an English Orthodox rabbi, philosopher, theologian, and author, offers fur further clarification distinguishing between law and covenant. He says, social contract, in essence law, creates a state. Social covenant creates a society. Social contract is about power and how it is to be handled within a political framework. Social covenant is about how people live together despite their differences. Social contract is about government. Social covenant is about coexistence. Social contract is about laws and their enforcement. Social covenant is about values we share. Social contract is about the use of potentially coercive force. Social covenant is about moral commitments, the values we share, and the ideals that inspire us to work together for the sake of the common good. The importance and power of social covenant for countries working, be working better for their populations is also documented in a 2013 Carnegie Council report that addressed a number, number of troubled nations, including Syria, Sri Lanka, Iraq, Nigeria, Miramar, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Kenya, many that have been considered failed states. The study concluded, all these states are missing something more fundamental than a social contract between the state and its population. They lack a social covenant that binds society together, allowing it to cooperate, to build a better government and country. Forged from negotiations between different groups, social covenants build common identity, common values, and a common sense of purpose for the state. They define justice and natural rights in defining the origins and makeup of political society. In essence, they are about society building, fashioned with the understanding that a cohesive society is a prerequisite to a successful state. Our nation was founded on such social covenants, rooted in the spiritual wisdom and principles of our Judeo-Christian roots and the evolving perennial wisdom that have, has grown out of them. The American Declaration of Independence proclaims, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, Government are instituted among men. The preamble of the Constitution enumerates the basic funct functions of the government, beginning with to establish justice and ending with to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, meaning all the generations that follow. And finally, the Pledge of Allegiance, first drafted during the Civil War, is a declaration of loyalty not only to the flag, but also to one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Visionary economist and author John Ickerd, who penned a collection of 12 essays under the heading The American Covenant in response to the threat he perceived in the possible re-election of our 45th president in 2020 and now again in 2024, concluding that our covenant to continually pursue a more perfect, in essence, democratic union is at serious risk. He begins by acknowledging that the government our founding fathers were able to form fell significantly short of the lofty standards they aspired to in our founding documents and covenant. But he notes that over the succeeding decades and centuries, as previous slaves, women, and Native Americans were granted the right to vote 
and eventually were actually allowed to vote, the U.S. government has gradually transformed into a democratic republic. He also contends that our founding fathers anticipated and facilitated this transition evolution. In Article 5 of our U.S. Constitution, they define the process for amending the Constitution to facilitate the transition from a republic to a democracy. The election of senators by popular vote and the expansion and protection of voting rights were accomplished through such constitutional amendments. Nevertheless, Eichard warns, over the past 40 years, with the shift away from government commitment to promoting the collective good in favor of a theory that a freer marketplace would do that well, the remnants of the republic have been used to block further progress toward democracy. He cites the election of presidents with electoral college majorities, but popular vote minorities, the misuse of the Senate filibuster rule, the politicization of the Supreme Court appointments, and the establishment of corporate personhood as examples of these blocks to democracy. Now, I could go on about all of that. It's tapping into my previous life when I majored in political science and worked in state government. But instead, I want to shift to why this is relevant to our spiritual journey and what we can do about it. I think I've already made the case for the spiritual foundation of justice, liberty, equality, and the pursuit of happiness, which Ickert defines as a quest for well-being, goodness, purpose, and a meaningful life. Values that also represent outward demonstrations of evolving into our inherent oneness, in essence, evolving into truly loving one another in the unconditional and perfect meaning of agape love to love one another as God loves us, which partially translates into co-creating a society in which Maslow's basic hierarchy of needs are met. In essence, for everyone, there is clean air, water, healthy food, clothing, shelter, health care, physical safety, and security, and any other physical necessities of life. Only after these survival needs are met, as Maslow taught us, Can people individually focus on and pursue the higher levels of happiness, like positive relationships with others, purpose beyond survival, and meaning, all which the government cannot provide? It's important to acknowledge, however, that even as we have had at least 50 years now of increasing economic affluence in the United States, granted it hasn't reached everyone, but the general flow is that we continue to grow in affluence, it has not produced any greater national sense of physical, mental, or even economic well-being or happiness. In fact, we have witnessed the opposite. More money is clearly not the key to happiness or escaping the malaise that has continued to spread across our nation. New York Times writer David Brooks, in an article entitled How Covenants Make Us, suggests that modern forces such as global migration, economic globalization, the internet, and a culture of autonomy and self-determination have liberated the individual, or at least the well-educated individuals, but have been bad for our natural cohesion and the social fabric that makes up our country. And whereas the liberation of the individual was supposed to lead to mass empowerment, its actual effect has been people more often being plagued by a sense of powerlessness and a loss of efficacy. Brooks concludes that what we're missing is covenant, the rich social fabric that helps define who we are. He quotes Ralph Aldo Emerson, who put it this way, other men are the lenses through which we read our own minds. It leaves us with the question, how do we reweave a social fabric that can be sustained in a globalizing, diversifying world, and that preserves our individual freedom while strengthening our social solidarity. Brooks quotes Marcia Paley of NYU and Fordham from her new book, Commonwealth and Covenant, who offers this clarifying concept. What we want, she suggests, is separability amid situatedness. We want to go off and create and explore and experiment with new ways of thinking and living, but we also want to be situated 
embedded in loving families and enveloping communities, thriving within a healthy culture, infrastructure that provides us with values and goals. She adds that creating this sense of situatedness requires a different way of thinking. When we go out and do a deal, we make a contract. When we are situated with something, it is because we have made a covenant. A contract pr protects interests, pally notes, but a covenant protects relationships. Specifically, Paley says, a covenant exists between people who understand they are part of one another. It involves a vow to serve the relationship that is sealed by love. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people shall be my people. Quoting from the book of Ruth. Brooke concludes that we can repair this social fabric by hundreds of millions of people making local covenants, widening their circles of attachment across income, social, and racial divides, which is something that used to be accomplished by our religious institutions where people of all economic levels would come together and where we would cross over what often divided us in our personal lives into a collective. But that now doesn't seem to exist. They say that uh, the 10 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the day, of the, of the year or the, of the week now. So we're, we're seeing that our spiritual institutions aren't necessarily being able to accomplish that anymore. And this is where COPA comes in. Over the past six plus years, a number of us have experienced making and living into covenants with COPA's other member institutions and the diverse array of individuals that they represent. Widening our circles of attachment across income, social, cultural, religious, and racial divides, discovering how much we share in common, not the least of which is the love for our country and a commitment to re-empowering our quest for a more perfect union. COPA is teaching us how to move beyond the partisan politics that are increasingly and purposefully divisive. COPA is teaching us how to obtain and sustain political power within a democratic system by organizing common people and money to ensure a seat at the table where decisions are being made that affect us all. COPA is teaching us how to practically and effectively stand and fight for the common good which is not only a balancing factor to individual freedom and essential to repairing our social fabric and ensuring that our democracy continues, but which also results in a sense of deep satisfaction, deep purpose, and a sense of belonging. Clearly, COPA is not the only way we can do this work. I know that many of you serve the community in various other ways, but I also know that COPA has transformed my life allowing me to put feet to my faith, helping me to grow in my capacity to truly love my neighbor, to even get to know my neighbor, and providing a meaningful alternative to the malaise and sense of helplessness and hopelessness that have left so many in our country in anger and or apathy. I'm so grateful for our community, for how you continually show up. Every time we ask for people to show up, you know, I think we're the smallest in size organization within COPA, and yet we are the most mighty. We have a reputation now for being one of the most mighty groups that show up out of the 25 groups. Many of them are churches with literally thousands of people, and yet we show up. It's incredibly energizing, so I want you to hear that from our, our COPA team, to know that we have your back, that we have your energy, that we have your support, and that you show up when we ask you to. So I look forward to sharing the convention experience with all of you who are able to attend, and please bring your family and friends, because together I know we can make a difference. Namaste.
already done so, I invite you to close your eyes and prepare for just a few moments spent contemplating these teachings. So bringing your, your awareness into the present moment, just noticing your body sitting here, noticing the gentle inflow and outflow of your breath. Noticing the sounds around you. Noticing the presence around you. Can you feel the presence of all those that are here today, those seated around you? Can you feel the presence of spirit? flowing in and through each and every person. And from this space, I invite you to use your power of imagination. And I want you to imagine a perfect world. Seeing our beautiful planet Seeing every plant and animal living happily and freely. Seeing every child loved. Every elder person cared for. Every person with differing abilities honored and accepted. setting aside your cynical mind that says this isn't possible. Continue to imagine our beautiful planet with enough food for all to eat, with housing for every person, health care for every person, Opportunities for connection and belonging available to everyone. Access to technology, access to nature, and the ability to engage in purposeful and meaningful work. Do you believe this kind of world is possible? It begins in our minds, in our consciousness, in our ability to imagine a world better than the one we live in today, in our ability to hold this image as a true possibility to work towards. So I invite you for just a moment now to reflect on this concept of covenant. 
Who are you in covenant with? And what responsibilities does that covenant require of you? Where are you willing to step forward to do just a tiny part to make this beautiful vision come true? What does God require of you? What is yours to do? So I invite you to spend just a few moments now in the silence, reflecting on this idea of covenant and what is yours to do in the silence. time to a close, I invite you to anchor this vision of a world that works for all. Anchor it in your heart and make a covenant with yourself to continue to believe in this possibility, knowing that what we hold in consciousness cannot help but begin to outpicture into our world. And so we give thanks for these teachings, for this time to come together and covenant with one another for this God that is all around us and beside us, always present in our lives, calling us ever higher. And so we say thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Well, we've reached the uh, time in our service where we have an opportunity to give back uh, and be an even bigger part of God's flow of good in the world. Unity of Monterey Bay is the collective consciousness and commitment of all of us who give of our time, treasure, and talent in order to sustain this spiritual community that is dedicated to transforming lives. We know that prosperity is a state of mind that finds blessings in every situation and abundance in joyous generosity. We transform all appearance of fear or lack into faith-filled peace of mind by shifting our attention to thoughts of gratitude for the abundance of God's good in our lives. And as the ushers come forward, 
I invite you to think of something you're, grat you're grateful for. And I'd like to share a little gratitude with you. So this may sound like the beginning of a sad story, but actually it's a very happy story. <laughs> my, uh, my sister-in-law, who had brain cancer, uh, passed away a few weeks ago. And I talked to her in the hospital, not, uh, more, not, not longer than a few weeks before she passed. And I said, how are you doing, Gail? And she said, I'm waiting for the nurse to bring me a chocolate-covered fudge bar. <laughs> and she said, I'm doing fine. And of course, she knew the, the truth of her condition. And, and I said, well, that sounds lovely. She said, the loveliest part is I'm going to eat all the chocolate off the outside first. <laughs> and she said, and then I might ask for another one. <laughs> so that, uh, that captures her spirit and her philosophy of life, too. She ate all the chocolate off of everything first <laughs> and then consumed the rest of it and then might have asked for another one. Uh, it's such an uplifting way to live your life, isn't it? And, uh, you know, the idea of covenant can sound a little somber, but there can be covenant that you bring uh, to it a joyous outlook in life. And now with our hearts and minds overflowing with gratitude, we breathe into the divine flow of God's good, trusting that we are enough, that we have enough, that there always is enough, both to have and to share. Uh, this is the fifth Sunday of the month. And it's the time when we um, give us a, a separate offering uh, for our building fund. So uh, we love our old building, but capitalize the old part. It is an old building. <laughs> and it needs uh, constant loving uh, care, which costs at least pennies. So if you, have it, uh, if you have the ability, please use an envelope, put building fund that are in the pews, put building fund on the outside of it so we get it to the right place and uh, add it to your uh, normal contribution for today. If you give online through auto payments from your bank, by credit card or monthly, we are very grateful. Please join us in faith and gratitude, demonstrating mindful intention by holding and blessing the basket and by joining in our offertory blessing. I am an open channel for God's infinite good, divine love flowing through me, blesses and multiplies, everything I give and everything I receive. I am both blessed and a blessing. Thank you, God.
Well, as always, we want to thank our all the folks who participate in making music here, all the singers, and great to have Larry Daniels with us today, and Paul Linda singing with us, and Sue, as always, did a beautiful job with the music, and so we are so grateful for all the ways that music allows the message to go deeper for us. And we want to thank uh, Jim Strathdee, Richard Burdick, Shirley Irina Murray, Murray, Brian Mann, Kelly Green, and that's it for their music today. <laughs> for their, yeah, for their music. Those are the composers of the music that we use today. So we give thanks. Okay, so you can sign up for um, what Vicki was talking about, COPA's 20th anniversary convention. Um, sign up in the back. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back. Okay, this is we have we just started doing this again. So, okay, will the ushers please come forward? It's hard to break old habits. All right. So it is with great joy that we bless and give thanks for these gifts and offerings that demonstrate our collective commitment to the spiritual work of love and transformation in our lives and in our world. And we dedicate this offering, our lives, and this ministry to more fully expressing the Christ light that is the truth of our being and inviting all people to know God's love. Finally, knowing that one with God, all things are possible, we affirm together the good is now, the rest is blessed, and the yet yet to be in our lifetime. The yes is bet to be. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you can sign up for the COPA convention Saturday, May 20th. Just one thing about COPA. We had such a great response last Sunday to attending the convention. We're all excited about that. Um, just a reminder that we are going to have a pre-convention gathering here at the church between 3.30 and 4.15, where you could park up here. We're going to have finger food and drinks, and uh, just to make it a fun occasion. And uh, we'll walk as a group from here, or we will also have rides for people who need rides, so you don't have to worry about parking. It's at the Golden State Theater right here downtown. All right? So on the sign-up sheet back there, there's a column for... I might, you know, I'm planning on attending the pre-convention. We just want to try to get a number so we have the right amount of food and drinks. And check if you, if you would like a ride. We will supply carpool rides down to the Golden State Theater and back. And if you would like, as a group. Good color choice. We're going to show up at the convention. I like it. And we'll be sitting together in the, uh, in the uh, theater. So do we want? Do we need to make a contribution for the nope. shirts? Or nope. cool, very nice, very nice. Thank you, Sue and Marianne. All right, and just one more reminder that we are going to be having um, our, the Monterey Chamber singers who use our church for their rehearsals are going to be giving a concert um, on Sunday, May 21st, right after the service. So beginning at 1130 and they said it would be only about 45 minutes long. So put that on your calendar. So as we bring our service to a close this morning, we are so grateful that you have chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us and join with us here. And whether it's your first time or, or you're a regular, we hope that you have felt comfortable with us and we want you to know that wherever you are on your spiritual journey you are welcome here uh, our chaplain on duty today is sue sue is available to pray with you after the service um, so we give thanks for that and for all of the uh, prayer chaplains who continue to hold the high watch throughout the week um, and pray on all of the prayer requests that come in through all the various channels. And we are grateful to be a prayer-conditioned church. So with all of that, let's form our closing circle for our prayer for protection and our peace song. Prayer conditioned. Because God knows we don't need air conditioning in Monterey. <laughs> I actually went into a store yesterday. They had the heat on. 
the Coley in Monterey. <laughs> And our circle gets bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> so as always, we create this circle of love and community and prayerfulness. And I invite you this morning, if you would be so kind as to hold Kathy Greenwald and John Heil, who are in need of prayer and loving support, holding them in this circle this morning and sending out to them whatever prayer you feel moved to, but holding them in this presence of God, of community, of love, seeing them lifted up, healed, restored to their rightful state of health and wholeness, and let them know that they are loved here. Can you please join me in our prayer for protection? The light of God surrounds us. I am light. The love of God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. The presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is. And all is well.